a preacher since Alabama lost, and I didn't know you made it. Here you go, Ruth. <laughs>
So God has definitely blessed uh, Manuel. He continues to bless us each and every day. We have people being saved, people being baptized, people joining the church. It's just an amazing time here in Emmanuel. We also have other opportunities to come and worship here at Emmanuel. We have a 3.30 Spanish service. We have a 5 o'clock evening worship service. Uh, we have Sunday school, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And also we have a Bible study on Wednesday night. We have, share a meal from 6 to 6.30 together. Then we study the Word of God from 6.30 to 7.30. We're actually studying Revelation right now. So you're all welcome to come be part of that. Have I missed any announcements anyone wants to make? Uh, you can look in your uh, bulletin to see the trunk of treats coming up real fast, too. That's where we all will set up right across the paved road here from the cemetery. And we'll give out candy and uh, Christian literature and stuff like that on uh, Halloween afternoon. We always have a huge turnout for this. Just hundreds of children come by and their parents uh, and visit us for trunk or treat. Any more announcements? Care committee tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. Anything else? Well, let's bow for a time. Father God, we do love you. We praise your holy name today. We thank you for this opportunity to gather again as a church family to encourage each other, to love on each other, to uh, laugh with one another, and Lord, just to wrap our arms around each other and uh, be there for one another. Thank you for such a loving church, Father. And I pray, God, that you'd continue to bless us and continue to use us as we reach out into this community and show the light of Christ to the world. Father, hear all our requests. Answer according to your will. Uh, heal those that need it and that uh, are asking for it, Lord. We just pray that you'll just take care of them. Uh, we pray, Father, not only heal them physically, but spiritually, emotionally, all the different ways. Some may be in financial need. Whatever the needs may be, God, we bring them before your throne asking for you to bless, to guide, and to take care of us. And we stand in need of your blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We had choir practice yesterday, and we had a good turnout, so things are looking up. I do have to share a real quick story. We was going to a song, and uh, Chip says, well, what page is it on? What page is it on? And somebody said, here's the book. He says, I don't need the book. I don't know it. And then he says, what's the words to it? <laughs> and I said, okay. Some songs don't need an introduction much. This next song is in the title. Says it all. Let's all remain seated as we sing How Great Thou Art.
sing a song and I see it affects people, it's well worth it. Amen. Amen. Grab your Bible, you want to turn to them, or the scripture will be up on the screen. We're going to be reading out of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4 today. Second Timothy chapter 4, and I will be reading verses 1 through 5. Good to have all the kids here today, but amen. Love to see these kids. Never know what they're going to do or say. Kind of like some of us adults. <laughs> All right, we're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? And Paul is writing this to young Timothy, and this is what he's saying to Timothy. And it's good for us today. Verse 1, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, <coughs> do the work of an evangelist, make proof of thy ministry. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <laughs> As many of you know, I've been in the ministry for about 46 years now. Through the years, I have gathered a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't work in piles, I work in piles. I got piles of literature, piles of stuff all over the place. I've got a newspaper article here that is dated Friday, May the 28th. 2004. So this is a long time ago. And the title of the thing, of the newspaper article is this. Hong Kongers hope Buddha's finger will bring peace. And it's a big long article. And part of it says this. In Hong Kong, tens of thousands of people lined up Thursday and to see one of the Buddha's fingers. Another part of it said, many said that Buddha's finger offered Hong Kong fresh hopes for peace and calm. Another part where one guy is speaking, he said, I think the finger will protect me through the pains of life. And then it's got a picture and other things. But on the picture, it says a man prays next to one of Buddha's fingers, which is shielded in a bulletproof glass box at Hong Kong's convention center on Thursday. I don't know what you think about that. <laughs> to us who believe in Christ, that is foolishness. To think that Buddha's finger can bring peace Bring hope. Donald, who would want to take and have a finger that's been kept around all these years in a bulletproof little glass box to pray beside? That's unusual. The title of my message today is Taking a Stand for God. Taking a Stand for God. Years ago, many of you may remember the name of Catherine Booth, a strong evangelistic lady who impacted Britain with her life. 
And it is said that when Catherine Booth, the mother of the Salvation Army, died in 1890 of cancer, that her body lay in state in Congress Hall. And here's what it says about that. Because of where she was, the poorest of the poor mingled with members of Parliament as they filled past the casket. All were eager for a last look upon the face that they loved. Rufkins passed her weeping. Prostitutes turned from her side and begged to be taken home where they could change their life and begin life anew. One person, an alcoholic, shouted out, That woman lived for me. They drew by the side of her casket for days, and many accepted Christ. Three men dealt, knelt together that night at the head of the coffin, repented of their sins, and asked Jesus Christ to come into their life and were saved. One person said, I've come 60 miles to see her again. She was the means of my children becoming saved. What a testimony. The testimony was not so much about Catherine Booth, even though she was used by God to impact lives. But the hope she gave was Jesus Christ. Hong Kong's hope was in the finger of Buddha. Jesus told his disciples, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. If we believe the Bible, which I do, if we believe the Bible to be the Word of God, then there's just one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. He is the one who came, taught us, lived, died, gave his life for us. That if we put our faith in Him as being the last sacrifice and His shed blood can wash away our sins, we can be saved. Which means when we die, we go to heaven. At the age of 15 and a half, I didn't know because I didn't grow up in church and didn't have all the Bible knowledge that, say, these kids that are being brought to church today had, or many of you had growing up in church. I didn't quite understand or know that at 15 and a half, I knelt in an altar and said, Jesus, I don't understand it all, but I believe in my heart that you are God's Son and that you died for me. And I want you to come into my heart and change my life. He did that that day. Did I become perfect? Oh, gosh, no. Still not perfect. Won't be that way. Those of you that know me know that's a true statement right there. One day I will be perfect when I get to heaven. God will do that. And you will too if you know the Lord. Amen. But here on earth, there's still things for us to do. And Paul was talking to young Timothy, his protege, and teaching him. And he's telling him here, take a stand for God. Take a stand for God. So I thought I would share some thoughts from these five verses of Scripture with you today about taking a stand for God. And I wanted us to kind of look at it just a little bit. The first thought I had is this. Our times, the times we live in, our times, they are difficult and desperate. Difficult and desperate. If I had read to you a couple of chapters before, in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verse 1, it says, But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Paul is saying to Timothy throughout his writings to him that even though that was a different era than it is today, it was difficult times. Paul himself had been beaten with rods. He had been shipwrecked. He had been chased out of town. He had been stoned. He had been, and I'm not talking about stoned with alcohol. I'm talking about they were throwing rocks at you. And if you've never had rocks chucked at you, you're missing out on a tree. 
we grew up in the mountains where we threw rocks at each other. I got a little dent right here on the side of the head. He thought I was crazy. It's just from the dent I got inside the head. We were throwing what we called dirt clogs at each other. Guy picked up one dirt clog because they'll, you know, they'll hit you and they'll bust and it ain't too bad. But his, when he picked up one, he threw it and it had a rock in it. When it busted, that rock got me. But uh, anyhow, Paul had been through all of this and he knew the times were difficult. And with Christianity coming on and Jesus being hated by both its own people and the Gentiles, they were after him. And so Paul was telling Timothy, listen, it's tough times, difficult times. People believe in all kinds of gods and all different manner of things. You're going to have a hard time, Tim. But you need to take a stand. A true stand. A hard stand. A real stand. Because our times, they are difficult and desperate. And the word difficult there in the King James literally means uh, perilous. It means violent, savage, fierce time. And Paul knew that Timothy was going through that. So he comes here in the fourth chapter, part of his letter, and he says to Timothy, I charge thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. He's telling him to take a stand there. He says it's going to be tough, it's going to be rough, and you need to do this. Paul had said in different places that evil men and imposters who proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, would cause much havoc. Our time, look around. Pornography, prostitution, child abuse, child slavery, any kind of wickedness you could think of, it's around us. We may not see it as much. We may not participate in it. But it's either. And it's the world we live in. And many of us have, I'm not saying a wrong attitude, but many of us have the attitude, okay, I'm older. I'm not worried about me. But we worry about our kids and our grandkids. Because what are they going to say? I grew up in a time where sin was still prevalent, but it was hidden. We are now at a time where sin is prevalent and it is flaunted. We make light of religion, we make light of God. People who go to church are made fun of and thought to be ridiculous. That we need a crutch, I'll be the first one to say, I need a crutch. I cannot live a righteous, holy life on my own. I need the help of Jesus Christ. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the Word of God, without you, my good friends and family, church family, my brothers and sisters in Christ, no telling where I would be. I need crutches. I need help to keep standing. My prayer all the time is God make me like Caleb. Give me the mountains. I still got some strength. I still want to work for you, God. I still want to build up your kingdom. But God, I need your help every day. Every day. Something new pops up every day. God is opening more opportunities than I ever dreamed of. Just coming to a small church like a man. I had a pastor call me yesterday, talked to me for over an hour. He lives in the area of Meadow. He pastors three small Methodist congregations. One church he has four to six people every Sunday. The other two he has somewhere around 10 to 12, maybe 14 people at their services. 
He says, I saw the article about you in the paper. And he said, I saw it in the Advocate. And I saw the video that they showed at the conference about a manual. He says, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Help me. He says, I've been a school teacher. I'm in my middle 50s. I've retired. And I felt called to pastor. And I need help to try to help these churches. And we talked for about an hour about different things he could try, things he could do to try to build up those three little churches. I never dreamed I'd have people calling me up asking my opinion about stuff. Uh, but God has opened that. And they, they several other pastors. One is at uh, Odom United Methodist Church. One is at Scriven United Methodist Church. I've gone and had lunch with him. And he wanted, he's got two small churches. He says, what are you doing? They say, how can you grow a church in Brunswick in the area of two big Methodist churches, the chapel and uh, College Place? He says, everybody says when you're a small Methodist church around bigger Methodist churches, you're just going to die out. He says, you're proving them wrong. What are you doing? And I shared with him about making sure he involved his life into the lives of his people. Pour his life into them. Love them. Get to know them. Pick at them. Cut up with them. Go out to eat with them. Don't just go in on Sundays and preach to them. But know who they are. Let them see the real you. Many of you know the real me. You see the real me. I, hide, I don't hide anything, really. You know about my divorce. You know about different things I've been through. Those are real things. The things you go through. Your life experiences. God can use to help others. When you open up and share, I've been through this. Maybe this will help you if you're going through some of the same stuff. We all go through stuff, folks. Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, take a stand. Take a stand. Because the times, they are difficult. They're desperate. <clears throat> the second thing that he tells young Timothy, <coughs> not only was about our times, but about our stand. What are we to do? And he lists a couple things here in verse 2 about what we're to do. He says, preach the word. Well, for Timothy, being a missionary, pastor, church planner, evangelist, whatever title you want to put to him, and really all of those, for Paul to tell him to preach the word means your life needs to be Standing on the Word, living out the Word, telling people about the Word. Scripture should be your standard. What's the standard of my life, the standard of your life? It is the Word of God. Amen. We don't always do it. We don't always live it right. And we fail miserably. And thank God in His Scripture, in the Word of God, He tells us that He is just to forgive us of all unrighteousness when we confess it. I spend a lot of time confessing. I don't know if you do, but I do. Where I come up short. But if you want to know what's expected of you, if you want to know how you're to live, it's right here. It's in the Bible. And there's more there on how to live and what to do than we can accomplish many times because of the flesh we live in. But here's the standard. The rules, you might say. Can you imagine the day that uh, Moses came off the mountain with those Ten Commandments and saw the golden aisle down there the day of May? He's a typical preacher. He, he got the flesh. He threw the Ten Commandments down and busted and had to go back and get them again. It's tough. You pour your heart out 
try to teach and preach, whether it's because you're a parent, because you're a school teacher, because you're a pastor or a preacher, or because you're just trying to help somebody, and then you see them go a different way. Sometimes it's heartbreaking and it's tough, but still, you have to stay in. And Paul was saying here to young Timothy, I charge you, I tell you, I command you, preach the word and be instant, in season and out of season. What does instant, in season and out of season really mean? It means to keep your mind sharp, to stay close to the Lord, to be alert. Be alert. Because around every corner, something can come up and derail. Get your attention. Cause you to say something that's wrong. Cause you to think something that is wrong. Cause you to commit an act that is wrong. And it happens so quick. Let me give you an instance. You ever been driving down the road and somebody cuts you off? And before you know it, you said a bad word. You had an ugly thought towards that person. Rage came up. Young lady in one of my former churches, about my kid's age, she's driving down the road. She's talking on the phone. Somebody cut her off. Pulled in front of her, run her off the side of the road. She got thrown in jail because she chased that woman. And she chased her for several, several miles. And the lady that run her off was in the wrong. But she was also wrong trying to chase her down, wanting to flip up on her. And she chased her, and the woman in the front called the police, said, I got this crazy person after me. And they told her to go home. And Tia chased her all the way to her house. And when she pulled into the driveway behind her, the cops pulled in. And of course, Tia was still mad, full of rage because of being cut off. She's a good Christian girl. Goes to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Loves the Lord. But it came up on her before she knew it. And... Uh, they took her locked her up and she had to get mailed out by her husband. And had to explain to the church and everybody else. Her just getting a bit of rage. Road rage. It can come up on you that quick. We can do something wrong. We have to be alert. And so Paul is telling Timothy, you know, our times are difficult and they're desperate. And our stand, it needs to be clear and concise. And the Word of God is to be our standard. And we always ought to be alert. And we need to always, always take a stand. I read this. When Paul says there to take a stand. And when it says to reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That means take a stand. Reprove people or rebuke people. Next day. It is told this that while as a teenager, a student at Yale University, the great American theologian Jonathan Edwards, I believe he preached uh, a sinner in the hands of an angry God. And he used to preach that with such power, people would actually faint. Because he made it so real that being held over the flames of hell when people would pass out. And Jonathan Edwards, even as a teenager at Yale University, wrote in his diary these words, Resolved that all men should live for the glory of God. Resolved, second, that whether others do or not, I will. Boy, that's some good results. That all men always live for the glory of God and whether they do or not, he says, I will. And may we have that same resolve in our hearts that we will take a stand to live for God 
no matter what. When it's convenient, when it's unconvenient. When it's easy and when it's hard. And when it costs us and when it doesn't. We resolve to live for God. Undoubtedly, you resolve to live for God. You got up out of bed this morning when many could have laid in bed and slept. You decided to go to church when some wanted to go to the golf course or other places. You resolved to be here to worship when you could have watched it on television. You resolved to come and hear somebody like me instead of hearing somebody great like uh, David Jeremiah or Charles Stanley or some of the great preachers that I love to listen to. You come and listen to little old me. I appreciate that. Our stand, clear and precise. Let me give you one more quick thought. That what Paul is telling young Timothy that hopefully will impact our lives. Our impact. Our impact. It will be pure and practical. That's what it ought to be. Pure and practical. Paul was telling Timothy, our times are difficult. Our stand needs to be built on the Word of God. It needs to be clear and concise. And our impact, it will be pure and practical. It doesn't have to be elaborate, elaborate or anything like that. But never underestimate the impact that we, individually or together, can make on those around us. I give you the words of Winston Churchill in closing. Winston Churchill said this, Never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. And I would add to that, Never give in to sharing the Word of God and taking a stand. Each of you are an important part of God's kingdom. And God loves you so very much. And God wants to continue to use you to the day He calls you home to glorify Him and to build up His kingdom. You are here for a purpose. Find your purpose. And serve your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your mind. Honor you and love you. Chris is going to come and lead us in our invitation to him. All of us going to come and play. And during this time, the altar's open if you want to come and kneel and pray for anything over any issue. If you can't kneel because of health and you just want to come and stand. And pray, come. If you need me to pray with you, I'll be over to the side. If you want to join the church, whatever's on your heart and mind, this is your time to take what God has put on my heart to share with you and deal with it. And it may be something just as simple as say, God, I want to take a stand. Life is difficult, but I want to take a stand so that I will make an impact on my family on my friends, on my community, in my church. I come, God, ask you for help to do that. Whatever you need to pray, whatever you need to do, this is your time. Would you stand and would you come while we sing? Amen. Would you be seated? <clears throat> Many of you have gotten to know Floyd mostly, and we are honored that Floyd has come today uh, to join our church. And uh, he gave testimony to what and I did what we like to do best. We went and ate the other day. And uh, we took and uh, uh, got a chance to really get to know each other. And I didn't have to ask for a lot of questions. He just come right out and says, Pastor, I want you to know I know Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. And I love Jesus. And I thought, wow. Usually I have to ask somebody that. But uh, he just come right out and shared with that. That's a great testimony. 
I don't know, you don't want to get to know Hoyt, but he's never been baptized, so he wants to join our church today by baptism, and we're going to receive him, and we're going to go through the process of baptizing him right now. So Hoyt, we're glad you're here today. Um, let me go through this with you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without Christ. I present to you today Hoyt Mosley for baptism. Hoyt, on behalf of, our, of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of weakness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? Amen. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form they present themselves? Yes. 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 Lord, you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Yes. Amen. And according to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? Amen. To the congregation, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Amen. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Hoyt here now before you in your care. Amen. We now come to the part of baptism. Hoyt, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Hoyt, the Holy Spirit work within you and may you be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ for the rest of your life. Amen. God bless you, Hoyt. We love you, brother. We're glad to have you to be a part of our church. In just a moment, uh, the acolytes are going to come and they're going to take the candles out representing the, uh, the light of Christ going out into the world. And I'm going to have you stand up here at the front and let everybody come by and welcome you into our church. Thank you. Amen.